Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Jens Hoffmann. I'm responsible here at Art Basel for uh, the project Art Parkour. This is the second year of Art Parkour. And before I introduce uh, my um, panel panelists, um, Jinka Shonibara and John Jonas, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what Art Parkour is about. Um, Art Parkour began last year, and this is the second year. And we have commissioned 10 artists last year to make site-specific interventions into various sites in the city of Basel. Last year, we focused on the area around the Münsterplatz. And we were working in the um, Museum for Cultural History, the Museum for Natural History. We had several works um, actually on the River Rhine. Uh, we were inside the Münster. And um, the desire was to bring art outside um, the fairgrounds, bring it into the city, find historical sites that also let the audience explore the history of, of Basel and um, also the city of Basel a little bit. Uh, this year we moved uh, further down to an area called St. Alvantal, which is located between the Kunstmuseum and the Museum for Gegenwartskunst. Um, and uh, this year we have again 10 artists that have made new pieces um, for Art Parkour. Um, Art Parkour is open every day from 2 to 10 o'clock. So if you haven't seen it, I uh, would encourage you to go and have a look. It's open till Sunday. Um, tonight is a special event. Um, at 9 o'clock, uh, the artist Chris Johansson is going to make a, a concert with his band Sunfoot on a container ship that is docked down there for which he has created a quite large-scale installation with a, with a stage. And all the sites are going to be open from um, 2 o'clock onwards till midnight today. Um, I just um, wanted to introduce you to Yinka Shonibara, uh, an artist based in uh, London, and John Jonas, an artist uh, based in New York. Um, both of them are participating in Art Parkour um, this year, have created new works for it, and our um, idea for this afternoon was to talk a little bit to Yinka and Joan about their pieces and about the process of how these works have uh, come together. And um, maybe i just begin uh, with Yinka. If you could just speak a little bit about the piece that you have created, about the location and how the, the piece came together. And I think, you know, that's maybe also a good opportunity to speak a little bit about your work in general for audiences that are maybe not so familiar with your work. Okay. Um, well, a lot of my work I mean, my work has really come from my, my background, really, my, my identity. Um, I'm an artist living in London. Um, my parents are Nigerian. And um, I grew up in both Nigeria and in London. And um, the big issues, really, around my work is about how to negotiate uh, power relations between um, Europe and Africa, if you like, but how that also um, how that really has been the key to forming my own identity. You know, this relationship, the colonial relationship between Europe and Africa, and also um, as a you know as a young artist, really trying to define my practice. Uh, when I went to art school, um, you know, I was I started making very political work, and um, I was making work about Perestroika, uh, which was in Russia, and. Um, one of my tutors at the time said to me, well, I mean, you are um, of African origin, aren't you? Uh, why don't you produce authentic African art? And my background being somebody who kind of grew up in a crazy city in Lagos and also in London, um, I couldn't understand why the particular question about authenticity uh, was never really posed to my colleagues um, at, at, at college at the time. Um, you know, you wouldn't expect uh, a European artist to, to focus on medieval art, you know. I mean, that, that would be um, a very strange thing to do. So really, what my work is also about, it's essentially about uh, parody or parody of power so that um, the thing that I'm actually supposed to be I'm afraid of is the thing that I actually parody, but also there is an internal conflict in myself, and that internal conflict is, on the one hand, 
I want to critique power, but on the, on the other hand, I actually don't want to be subservient to power. I also want um, a slice of that power. So um, there, is a, there is really actually a genuine conflict here because on the one hand, I mean, for, the, for those of you who might know, um, I use the um, letters MBE after my name. And the reason I, I do this, the, I mean, this was an honor that was given by uh, the Queen you know, of England uh, for services, for my services to art, and which is, you know, the title is member um, of the most excellent order of the British Empire. And historically, um, a number of uh, people who have uh, received this award, um, you know, like the Beatles, for example, um, they actually returned it. I know that John Lennon returned this uh, award. And, but, and then a number of people have returned the award. Um, but I decided that actually this is a debate. The award itself is about a debate about, um, you know, about royalty, about um, you know, re Republican debates, about power, power relations. So I decided that actually rather than, you know, because it's, it would be expected for me to just give it back. But rather than just to give it back, to appropriate uh, the, the, this, and, to, and also because my name is, is, is not an English name, it's a Nigerian name. So I, I envisage that actually to have Yinka Shonibare, this uh, foreign name, next to member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, is a kind of continuing performance on the page, which becomes um, a platform for, for a number of questions about those uh, power relations. But in relation to the project I've done here, um, uh, for me, actually, work outside of public art, it, it's a relatively new uh, uh, departure for my work. Um, for those of you who've been to London, I mean, at the moment, I have the ship in a bottle uh, in Trafalgar Square, which is uh, on the fourth plinth. And it's, a, it's a, um, Nelson's ship, uh, you know, in, in, in a bottle. Now that, um, and then the sails of the ship are made out of the African textiles. Now brief history of the te uh, textiles I use very quickly. And uh, the textiles originate from Indonesia and um, the Dutch decided in the 19th century to produce the textiles industrially uh, for sales, um, first of all, to the Indonesian market. And the fabrics, the in industrial versions, were not uh, popular in Indonesia. So they tried uh, uh, West Africa, and the fabrics were public, uh, popular there. But a lot of people, uh, when they see the fabrics, they assume them to be authentically African. So going back to my original question that I put to you about uh, notions of authenticity, I, I found the fabrics to be a good metaphor for talking about global relations, global trade, uh, trade routes, and also for talking about power relations uh, between different spheres. But then, ironically, uh, what is actually meant, what is essentially um, eclectic in its formation, which is the uh, the fabric itself has been adopted as a symbol of authenticity, or if you like, authentic you can read for authenticity, read nationalism. So um, for me, that's why I use the fabrics. But there is also, what I like about the fabric is that the fabric itself then carries the fallacy, if you like, or the fantasy of the exotic. But actually, it is in itself a refusal of the notion of the exotic in its inauthenticity. So if you, know, if you understand what I'm trying to say there. So for the, um, um, uh, for the uh, project here uh, with the kites, um, because basically, for those of you who, who haven't seen it yet, um, I've got about 500 uh, kites. Um, kind of hanging from the trees, and they're very colorful, and they are uh, along the Rhine. And um, that project 
for me, the idea of the kite was really celebratory and also it evokes uh, a sense of escape. And this started as a project um, I did with uh, Jens uh, in um, San Francisco. And um, it came as a result of uh, uh, reading uh, Huckleberry Finn. And in the, in the book, um, there's a character, um, a, a slave, that actually escaped. And so um, I was actually, because again, I talked earlier about power relations. And so my work is never really about championing the notion of the victim. You know, it's always about empowerment. So for me in the book, I actually found the agency of the, um, of the slave, Jim, uh, a very powerful symbol uh, for being in control of your own life, even though you're being uh, suppressed by others. So. Um, so that's why that character was particularly uh, important for me in the book. And, and so, but I did not want to do something uh, literal or to, to just simply illustrate. But I like the, the sense uh, of, you know, I also, I mean, my work is also about the kind of trying to talk about serious subjects, but try to talk about it in a seemingly light and poetic manner. But as you engage with the poetry of the work, you might then be able to start to understand certain things about what I'm saying. But at the same time, the question of ambivalence is central to my practice because actually I'm an artist. And I cannot actually say to you that I know 100% actually myself. I don't know sometimes, you know. And sometimes I fall between the two, uh, the two things, you know, like I don't. I don't want to be part of the establishment because I hate the establishment. But then when I got a letter from Tony Blair that I got this award, I was uh, secretly excited about going there. You know, so, uh, you know, and, and so the work is really somehow trying to capture uh, some of this. Sort of capturing this form of ambiguity, sitting between being on the outside and receiving an award like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you said, like the, the, the poetic side of your work? How would you describe that? Um, how does this sort of poetry come materialize itself in the work? Well, you know, for me, art is a form of utopia. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to reach, it's a bit like alchemy in a way. You know, I'm trying to construct the right chemical mix, you know, but it, it's, and it's a form of escape as well for me as well, on many, many different levels. I mean, because, you know, I'm a person who, have a, who has a, I have a physical disability, but through my art, I can escape to co sort of different realms, which is actually may not be possible in the physical space. You know, so, and for me, this, there's a, that level of poetry is the, intangible that cannot be reached in the real world or in the real life. So if I was to physically challenge power in the real way, of course they would just shoot me down, you know. So I have to find other ways that's yeah. not, uh, um, you know, it, it's not reality, you know, it's, it's non-reality. And my art can actually take me to those realms. You think like the, the poetry comes through the metaphorical qualities that your, your work have, has? I always feel like it's, it's very open to how you actually approach the pieces and, and what interpretations you can find. Like with the piece here, for example, I think one of the mo important elements is that the, the, the kites can actually not escape. They're all stuck in the, the branches of the tree. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, I, I think that um, for me, for a work of art, it's very important that it's not one direction and closed because then it you know then you are you are exactly the same as the dictator if you're if you're trying to be to close the debate you know you are it has it needs to be open-ended uh, because you are not i'm not a politician um i you know and i always say that you know uh, um i'm not yet yeah, i mean the, the the work is not like uh like a political campaign, you know. So it, it needs to be 
Art needs to move above or beyond uh, a dictatorship, you know, in that way. So that's why it's impossible for me to make such close, uh, yeah. close things. No, I think what you always interested me about your work <coughs> was that you were able to be, on the one hand, formally very innovative, and on the other hand, also politically quite radical. And um, the openness of interpretation was another level that you know, really uh, fascinated me about your work. And thinking about the kites, I think when we were talking about making the piece, or you, you know, I thought on the one hand, the kites being stuck in the tree is sort of like um, expressing maybe the frustration of a, of a child that the, 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 the kite is stuck in the tree and you pull and you can't get it out and your toy is gone. At the same time, you know, thinking about the fabric, thinking about all of the history of colonization and you know, what you were just saying, the dependency between the, the, the former colonized countries and, and where we live, or England and, and Africa. So it has a really wide range of how to uh, approach that, I think. Joan, did you see Inca's piece? I saw it briefly because I haven't seen Art Parcours yet. I haven't been here. Yes, I did. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's a big honor for me uh, <laughs> coming from you because I'm an admirer of your Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Uh, um, you know, so for a younger generation artist, you know, it's very, when you get approval, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't think you need approval. <laughs> well, uh, you know. No, it's, it's a beautiful piece. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah. But I know your work. I've seen it. Oh, thanks Many so. times, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your contribution to Art Parcours. You're right at the beginning, and um, at the Marianne Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is actually interesting. The Marianne Foundation, where Joan's piece is located, is a foundation that takes care um, um, of the whole area where the um, Art Parcours is, is sort of in charge of uh, many of the buildings there, and it's you know, one of the oldest part of, of uh, Basel, and they helped us a lot in this process, finding venues and, and so on. And Joan's work is located in a little pavilion in the back uh, yard, which is a beautiful garden, and she's created a new installation and video work, uh, which is composed of uh, material from three different films uh, from the mid-70s onwards to like almost, I think, 2008. Um, and a new part that you specially created now for this presentation. Well, it's really a transformation of all that material. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's composed of a few more elements, too. I, I, I'm working, I've been working with, with um, literature for, for, I don't know, ever since I began making work a as a kind of background source material because I believe that um, the kind of work I do crosses all the boundaries of mediums. And so this holds all those elements because I'm working with technology. I was never interested, I, I have made special effects in the studio, but I'm very interested in making special effects myself by hand, by manipulating material and the camera itself in relation to each other. And so this piece was began last year, and actually it began as a performance, so you saw me doing all these things that you see in the video. But the video, I'm, that's the way I work, is to uh, perform the work and then record this performance with, an, with a camera. And there could be an audience or there could not be an audience. I'm performing for the camera, but there could be an audience watching me do this. So a lot of my work is based on that idea, that the audience sees the image making as it occurs and then they see the image that's a result of that image making. But so this piece is based on a, a novel by the Icelandic author Haldor Laxness and was written in 1968. I did a project in Iceland based on an Icelandic saga. So at that time, I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And I read all, um, a lot, many of his books. And I he's a wonderful writer. Many of you probably know who he is. And this piece is called Under the Glacier. And so. Um, when I decided to do this project, uh, I've never, I've recycled some of my work in different ways, but never in this way. And I took footage from a piece called The Shape, Descent, and the Feel of Things, and from um, the Volcano Saga, and a piece that was shot in a swimming pool called Disturbances, which very few people have seen anyway. And I'm interested in how an image can be transformed by its juxtaposition against another text or against other objects and images. And so what you see here are those um, earlier works, but layered on top of those uh, images are 
my manipulation of objects and materials on this table underneath the camera that's mixed with the earlier work. So um, I'm interested in how there's a figure of melancholia, um, which for me is a very, as for um, all of art history, and there's reference to art history in the beginning where you see a picture of artifacts with a, somebody's gloved hands um, showing that to the camera. And so it's also a reference to how we use artifacts from the past. And um, so melancholia is a major figure in art history and also for, I think, in contemporary history, just the idea of melancholia in this sense in the landscape. And so under the glacier is, a, is about a particular glacier in Iceland, but it's very, it's a melancholic idea now because the glaciers are, as you know, disappearing. And, um, and then the idea of water is, that runs through the whole text. So also in this particular piece, um, it, it really shows my ongoing interest and involvement with nature and landscape and as Laxness says, spirit. So um, it refers to that and also uh, layers of American history. There's one shot of a ruined playground that's shot in the Salton Sea in Southern California, which is a very strange abandoned ruin of a children's playground. And then just underneath that is a, a Native American beaded belt to refer to these layers uh, and some of the things that have happened in, in, the, in history. So I refer to different um, things. The text allows me to, to refer to different subjects. So um, when I uh, proposed you to uh, make a site-specific piece here for this particular location, can you maybe talk a little bit about the process? How do you get started uh, thinking about the site, and how does a project like this develop? Well, the piece, the video piece itself, um, is an independent project that I've just begun to work on, which I will go on working on. But it was a chance for me to show this fragment of it in a situation that's very intimate and um, kind of like a dollhouse, and to also make a, a space or a room. And so the drawings that I make in the video and also that are used in the video are, I've projected those and drawn them on the walls of the, uh, of the space. And one of the, some of the drawings are Rorschach tests. They're not actually Rorschach tests, but I made them like that. And so for me, those are emblematic of, it's just a little bit what Yinka was saying about how there's an ambiguity and there's no one way to look at things. And that's the way I look at the images is that you can see them in different ways, just as a Rorschach test is a test for somebody seeing something. And so it was fun funny, I, c I painted the inside of the room. I chose a color, I didn't see the space. Well, and I like this bit, I like it, it's very, it's interesting for me, to, I've never done something like that before, yeah. in a space like that. So coincidentally, the gray is the same color as the trimming in the house, that's exactly. a coincidence. But I like it when that happens. So, and also the, na the theme of nature, there's one story about a, a bumblebee and a dandelion, and that relates to the garden. So there's a, there are relationships that are nice. Yesterday, when I was walking uh, uh, along the parkour, looking at all the different uh, contributions the artist has made, one of the, the contributions or one of the pieces is a work by uh, Janet Cardiff and George Burris Miller, um, who have created a tiki bar, uh, you know, a South Pacific tiki bar inside an old water reservoir. And it's a very surreal experience. You have like the music from the South Sea interpreted by Elvis Presley, and they uh, serve you fruity cocktails down there. And at that moment, I couldn't really help but think that you know this was so such an odd, surreal situation. Why do you have a tiki bar in the old part of, of Basel? And somehow it seemed to me almost like uh, a metaphor for how you know sometimes these art projects sort of pop up in 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 a place where you know they have previously not been, previously not been seen, and figuring out the, the, the relationship of like, you know, what does this artwork have to do with this particular site? And I think one of the, the reasons that Art Bakur really came into a, a being was um, also in, in regards to, you know, how do we deal with public art or art in public space and how can we move away from just dropping sculptures here or installations on certain squares and, you know, develop a notion that is maybe more integrated into uh, the fabric of the city and the social and political circumstances. So my question to both of you, maybe to uh, um, finish our conversation, is just like if you could um, tell me a little bit about your experiences or your ideas in regards to art in public space, about you know, the, the 
the, the advantages, disadvantages, perhaps the necessities of it? Where, where, where could you see this go? I see it's something that um, I'm extremely interested in, and I think you know many people in the audience probably are interested in. And, and th for me, there's always somehow uh, a difficulty. You know, how do you um, relate to the site and the specificities of of a, of a context? You know, not only the space, but you know, really the social, cultural, political realities that exist there, and the histories. You know, here in Basel, you're dealing also a lot with the histories. Well. I mean, in relation to public space, for me, um, I have to say that my first experience, no, actually, my first experience of, of putting art in public was on the London Underground in London. Uh, it was a series of photographs called Diary of a Victorian Dandy, and it was uh, you know, a black man in a Victorian period, and there were huge posters on the underground. I just remember that, you know, the image was kind of provocative, and people wanted to know, did this character really exist in the 19th century? And if he did, you know, who was he? Or some people wanted to know, you know, is it a film, or is it? But, but for me, really, the greatest thing about that was um, um, the, the audience. You know, you have a broad audience. It's not like in a museum where, you know, a few uh, focused people will go and see you know, the, the art is kind of intruding on people in a way, and also, for the most part, possibly ignored as well. So, um, and so the feedback I got from that, I found very, uh, very interesting. But in terms of like public sculpture, I mean, the Trafalgar Square project I have on now, I mean, I was told, you know, something like about 3,000 people an hour will go past. And also, the biggest challenge for me was how do I produce something that will be accessible to, to um, a large public, but also will be historically relevant and meaningful at the same time, and will not, because, I mean, for those of you who know Trafalgar Square, it's a very, the historical context is very heavy. It's got kind of male, powerful male sculpt, you know, uh, sculptures like male warriors and winners of wars and things, you know. And so it's really a forum for expressing colonial power. And so for somebody like me to enter that context, already my presence there is already controversial, you know, in terms of the history. And then, but how do I enter that space without, I don't want to enter the space with anger. I want to enter the space with something that will be meaningful and yet engage people at the same time. So it's, um, and I came up with the idea of just something that's kind of playful, like a ship in a bottle, which I've actually found that, that somehow that's really kind of connected to people. So in, in a sense, uh, the, what I, for me, what's important about public art is trying to engage with people on many different levels whilst understanding the historical context in which the work is actually shown. So that's my, I mean, that's been my own approach anyway to that, to, to public art. Well, I haven't done pieces like that so much, so thank you. I really enjoyed doing this. Um, but I can talk about my, some of my early performances that were in public spaces, but not thousands of people saw it because of the, <laughs> what the art world was. But um, I did a piece in downtown New York in um, the area of Chambers Street and the Lower West Side. And it was in an area that all, where all the buildings had been torn down. And it was just before they were, built the World Trade Center and all those new things there on the, on the shore of the Hudson River. And it's the kind of space that really appeals to me, empty lots and a kind of ruin. I'm very attracted to that kind of space. And so I made a performance um, that took place on a number of empty lots, 10 empty lots. And it was seen from the roof of a building by the audience. Um, and that, in a sense, you could call it, it was, although I had done it in Jones Beach, it was an outdoors piece. And it was really related. My outdoor pieces are all related to the actual space and measuring the space and the sound, the idea of sound and the distance and so on. So that interests me. Um, and I've done works in gardens. I'm inter because of the nature of my work, people don't ask me to do 
things the way they, the same way they ask you to do things. But I, I really am interested in this project with Jens, for instance, because it's not site specific. The video itself is not. And I'm not so interested in making a piece about, say, the Mirian Foundation, just to be very specific. <laughs> but um, I'm interested in working with that little, with that space. Yeah. And so, working with that space, I'm going to do another piece in a small space, kind of related to that. And this gives me a way to begin that. And um, it's very different. I like really much of getting out of the institution. And in the 70s, one did that a lot more, I think, than one does it now. Yeah, I think Inka touched upon something very interesting, which was the idea of how do you reach a wider audience? How do you reach an audience that maybe uh, doesn't cross the threshold of, of you know, going inside the museum or going inside the institution, as you said, going outside the institution. And I think there's a lot of potential for art in public space, and many different attempts have been made. And But I feel like that we have not really come to like some consistent idea of you know, how could this really materialize itself uh, in, in the future. And it's you know, still an ongoing debate, which I enjoy. I actually enjoy tremendously putting this, this project together, thinking about those type of questions. I think artists themselves have to make the proposals, actually. They uh, could. <laughs> that would be one way um, for that to happen. Yes, exactly. Yeah, And I hope that's going to happen. Well, let me thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be part of this talk and for agreeing to be part of Art Parkour and for your wonderful contributions to this project. And thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.